Tell me about your hat. It says, I will not I comply. comply. Yeah. Well, think about it. Um, are, we, are we expected to comply with unconstitutional laws in this country? We're not. And so what this is reference to is specifically to the idea of an assault weapon ban. We've already had the Supreme Court, which decided in Heller, that we do have a right to own firearms in this country. And the AR-15 is one of those. It's one of the most popular rifles in this country. It is in common use. So as a result of that, if you're going to pass an assault weapons ban, which is in direct contrast to what the Second Amendment says, what our Supreme Court has says, I mean, I'm not, not going to comply with unconstitutional laws. I'm just not going to do that, especially when it comes to utilizing the one gun that I think is in, in the best position to protect my. Boom sugar look ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters around the world. It is your boy Chris Shul, aka the esoteric nobody, aka the chocolate Nubian so brother from Ghana, West Africa. Dropping the wisdom and truth bombs here in Melbourne, Australia. You can rely on me because I'm true blue. I'm Dan Andrew. <laughs> sure to like the video, subscribe, click on the bell. Tell your friends, tell your mom, drop some comments. Let us know what it is. Let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start off with what's going on here in Melbourne, Australia. Apparently, everything here is true blue. Nothing going on over here. We're all enjoying the lovely sun. Uh, apparently, no one worries about boom shaka like a 19. At least this is what I've been hearing from some people, that Australia, everything is true blue. But the reality is what is seemingly going on and what is actually going on if you open your eyes, if you look at the context of everything that's happened and is happening, are very, very different. I mean, for starters, in Queensland, uh, it seems that the concentration camps, I mean, quarantine centers, uh, are now in full effect and uh, came across a report that Queensland has now decided the people who have been to an exposure site interstate, such as a shopping center or a store, will be required to go into government accommodation such as hotel quarantine. So even without a positive test, if you checked into a place that's considered to be an exposure site in another state, or if you're returning from another state within the last 14 days of it being declared as a hotspot, you'll be required to go into government quarantine. Ladies and gentlemen, now I want to make it very clear. Of course, this stuff is apparently necessary. Uh, this stuff is to respond to the severity of the crisis, the pandemic that we are under. But I want to make it very clear. I want to separate the science, the uh, reality in regards to uh, what is going on from the actual lawfulness the morality of what is going on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look, I'm going to be very clear with you. Fundamentally, there is something called objective rights, natural law. And if you believe in this kind of stuff, it's not an opinion. And anyone that perpetuates this idea that what is going on is in line with the human rights charter, it's somehow understandable because it's, it's a proportionate response. You have no idea about the actual lore of this land that was formed under the common law. It's so weird because I've been watching a lot of conversations lately about these issues back in the 50s, 60s, going through all these conversations that some of the brightest minds from universities all around the world. Uh, and they had this universal understanding that this kind of stuff was wrong. They looked at things like communism as being inherently immoral, most likely because they'd lived, they'd the last few years, they'd seen what it was like, what justifications had been used to bring about some of the most horrible acts. And they understood where this stemmed from, this safety argument, this um, we must uh, achieve goals and deny the rights of individuals. And this is the fundamental basis of communism. It denies the existence of God, um, favors the, the, the goal of strategies in order to attain, attain ends for the greater good, for the, for the people at large. And it does this by completely taking away the unalienable rights of individuals and starts saying things like, we must round people up for their security. I mean, have a look at history, ladies and gentlemen. I guess the problem is that, I know it sounds cliche, but we really, and I say collectively, haven't learned from our history or don't even know it. People don't really look at the causal factors that brought about some of the most 
tragic events in history. And as a result, we are seeing time and time again the same justifications. We're seeing tweets like this tweet I came across, ladies and gentlemen. And look, granted, if this was like a one-off occurrence, I'd be like, look, mate, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's obviously crazy. And we all laugh at it. But this seems to be a sentiment that is supported by many people at the moment. I came across this tweet that says, boom shakalakas, you know what I'm talking about, should be required by law. Aside from legitimate medical exemptions, fight me. You do not have the right to willfully and knowingly make other people sick. <laughs> and a lot of people are like, yeah, mate. In fact, this thing got 2,000, over 2,000 likes. And here's the, this is the rationale people have. That you think someone should be denied the right to move around, should be locked in their homes, because you made the assumption that they're intentionally trying to make people sick by simply not wearing a mask, by simply not wanting to get boom shakalakad. That is absolutely false. It is an assumption. It is definitively, unassailably, unequivocally false to assume that someone, because they're simply not wearing a mask, because they don't want to take an experimental substance, is trying to willfully make other people sick. These are the kind of disingenuous arguments people make. And people need to be called out for this stuff. I typically don't enter conversations with people like this because they're being disingenuous. They know what they're saying. They know that people aren't sim simply trying to make people sick, sick if they refuse to wear a mask, if they refuse to endanger themselves by putting a substance, which the reality is there are, and this is objectively the case, there's a reason why there have been o over b billions of dollars awarded to plaintiffs for boom shakalaka damages over the years. There's a reason why there's a, there's a default payment of $120,000 in the UK that's, that's given to people that have been maimed by these substances because they're dangerous. What you're advocating for is for people to risk their own life, risk their own bodily integrity because you want to feel safe. That's not only cowardice, that is un unequivocally immoral. And people need to start being called out for this kind of stuff. Because where is some time ago, we had this universal, it seemed generally a universal understanding that this kind of stuff was unacceptable, it was gross, it was immoral, regardless of what religion you subscribe to, and people knew what it led to. Now, this kind of sentiment seems to be supported by so many of the jabronis, so many of these woke people that have no understanding of human rights. And this is what it comes down to, ladies and gentlemen. It is a human rights issue. Not this human rights where you think you, you can suspend the rights of people because it may lead to consequences. Not this human rights where you don't believe in free speech and you want to advocate for, that hate speech is, is somehow unacceptable. <laughs> no, this, this really does come down to people not understanding history, not understanding the objective natural rights that we're, we're born with and want to advocate for these absolutely atrocious ideas. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we are seeing going on at the moment. This is what we're seeing going on, not only in Australia, mate, but around the world. We're seeing a situation where the wool has been pulled over the eyes of people. And look, regardless of whether or not you believe in the science, you believe in the severity of this thing, make no mistake about it. Okay, classic example, ladies and gentlemen. There is this narrative that this thing has been, uh, has been granted uh, approval by the FDA. This is the classic ruse. No, it hasn't, ladies and gentlemen. The FDA has not been willing to give, uh, g give this thing a tick of approval. You know what I'm talking about, the boom shaka lucker. But what they've done is they've given it the tick of approval under an emergency, uh, under a state of emergency, which is a legalese trick to pull the wool over your eyes. Where essentially, because they can't do it, because they can't give it the tick of approval, they've made this, and this is coming from Fauci, because it's been deemed that this thing is going to do more good, more good than harm, which is a very subjective idea, which is a communist idea, right? Which, in my mind, uh, buys into this idea that yes, there are potential ramifications, and this thing may not be uh, the most uh, <laughs> safe thing to implement on people. We're giving it a tick, tick of approval because we think it's going to do more good. More good for who? More good for the pharmaceutical companies? I'm just saying. That's not. That's not a tick of approval by the FDA. 
In fact, it hasn't been given the approval by the FDA. They've given it a special consideration, an emergency. So basically, in a state of emergency, the government can now do whatever it wants. It can now administer this kind of stuff. And now it can now go through the FDA. It can now suspend your rights. And this stuff is absolutely insane for anyone that is being honest about it. That's a classic example. The, the uh, other examples of deception are the fact that even the very definition of pandemic has undergone a change in definition. The very definition of human rights over the last few years, this is a, a slow incremental process, has undergone obfuscations where there is no objectivity now. There is no definitive right or wrong. In fact, the very concept of right and wrong, which should be Boolean, has now become a, a spectrum. Everything is proportionate. Now it's acceptable to rape, kill, commit all forms of fraud and aggression because it's acceptable given the circumstances. Oh, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is where we're at 2020 in a world where apparently... People are being forced to get boom shakalaka. People have been rounded up into concentrate. I mean, quarantine, quarantine camps. And uh, now it seems like we really don't have any rights, or if uh, any, if we do, one has to question how long they are going to remain. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, in other news, I want to move away from this. I want to go into a completely different area. And that is the realm of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin. Now, of course, for some time now, since about 2008, 2009, there has been a lot of talk about this technology known as Bitcoin, particularly the inventor of Bitcoin. Now, for those of you that have been following my work, you may, may have followed the interview I did with uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. That's right, I said his name, Craig Wright. Now, of course, a lot of people um, may be aware that Craig Wright is actually behind the creation, at least was one of the key developers of Bitcoin. Now, of course, there are many people that advocate that this is absolute nonsense. In fact, this is generally what you'll find within the crypto community. Understandably, and I'll be, I'll be real with you guys, like if I was going to be anything less than someone of integrity, I would tell you that, no, I, I don't want this guy to be the creator of Bitcoin. Because look, he's not someone that is the nicest person. He's not in line with my ideals when it comes to freedom. This guy is one of these libertarians that advocates for Austrian economics, but very much is in support of the state, has ideals that a lot of people within the crypto community do not agree with. That's why you will find time and time again, people don't like him. People don't want this guy to be the Satoshi Nakamoto that everyone presumed Satoshi Nakamoto would be. But Craig Wright is apparently... Uh, going to court to once again prove that he is the creator of Bitcoin. Now, a new lawsuit, according to an article I came across, could weigh in on who's the real inventor of Bitcoin, why its creation is, is still shrouded in mystery. Craig Wright, self-declared inventor of Bitcoin, arrives at federal court in West Palm Beach, Florida, U.S. on Friday, the June the 28th. Uh, this is a picture of him arriving there. Uh... uh Anyway, let's get into this. So, a copyright lawsuit brought by Craig Wright, the man who was claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonym used by the creator of Bitcoin. And look, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of evidence uh, in regards to this. And look, we can go back and forth and debate. If you want to watch my prior videos, uh, the stuff is very, very clear to me. You find people that have actually been following this from day one, actually understand the history of this thing, are very aware of Craig Wright's involvement. People in the crypto community, the, the, like the major players, are fully aware of what's going on, but they don't want to acknowledge it because it's, I mean, even someone like Roger Ver um, has openly said to uh, to people that, yeah, he knows he knows Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, granted, he's publicly gone back on this, um, but he was reported some time back to have spoken to someone um, from a, a cab ride from the airport and and spoken about how Craig Wright offered to show um, the, to, offered to sign the, uh, offered to sign the uh, the Genesis block, I think it was, um, with with the keys, offered Roger to off, offered to do this in front of Roger, and Roger said like he uh, Roger actually said that he didn't need a seat. He already knew that uh, Craig Wright was Satoshi Nakamoto, but also said that he would not come out and say this publicly. 
Now, there's an article on this, um, and look, granted, Roger Ver has actually gone back and said, oh, look, he doesn't believe Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. The Craig Wright is a fraud, understandably, but the ra rationale that he has given for this, understandably, are, in my opinion, because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, one, be hassled by this guy. This guy is not in line with what Roger Ver is trying to do. Roger Ver is all about freedom as a hardcore libertarian, like hardcore anarchist. I'm talking about anarcho-capitalist, and Craig Wright is not in line with that. And if Craig Wright was to uh, essentially just be pronounced as the creator of this thing and is threatening to do what he's been threatening to do, which is basically uh, end the, make life very difficult for people like Roger Ver because of what they're doing, and look, fundamentally, it comes down to ideology. Craig Wright is essentially wanting to uh, to to prevent people from using this thing to uh, do things that are not in line with the law. I'm talking about the state laws. And Roger Ver is all about freedom. Doesn't believe in governments. And essentially, this is a war that's going on, ladies and gentlemen. Craig Wright essentially wants to end the lives. Of, well, I'm I'm, sp I'm saying metaphorically, but wants to. And what these people are doing, people like Ross Ulbricht, people like Roger Ver, and in order to defend themselves, these people are people like Roger Ver are saying, "Look, man, I'm, I, yeah, I think deep down they know what's going on." Because look, I learned most of my understanding in regards to the history of what's what's going on here by Roger Ver. I've gone through hundreds of hours not of information, not just off of, on the history of what's been going on in regards to the origin stories of this from Roger Ver, for, but from Gavin Anderson, from Craig Wright, from all of the major plays, and it's very, very clear. If people actually took the time to look at what has been going on, they didn't just buy into the narrative that, oh, this thing is unequ unequ unequivocally the case, that Craig Wright has been involved in the creation of this thing. But once you understand the political machinations of play, you realize, oh, people can't openly go out and say this stuff. So look, without wanting to go into too much detail, it's very clear that Craig Wright has been involved in this thing from the onset. Um, uh, there is tremendous evidence for it, and I'm not going to get into an argument. Most people that, that deny this thing, say I don't know what I'm talking about, really have not done anywhere near as much research as I have. I've gone through hundreds of hours worth of information in regards to this, and it really does come down to people that... I, I, I believe that they have the same kind of logic that is in line with uh, speculation. It's like, oh, someone like Craig Wright couldn't be the creator of Bitcoin because he wouldn't act like that. And uh, because of this, because of all this circumstantial evidence, but when you actually have a look at the hard evidence, like anecdotal evidence, like the amount of people that have actually seen him sign the Genesis block, Gavin Andreessen, it's very clear. Anyway, don't want to go too long on this. Um, this article basically talks about how um, London High Court ruled on Thursday that R Wright the Australian computer scientist who first said in 2016 that he created Bitcoin eight years earlier could serve his copyright lawsuit against the anonymous operator and publisher of the website bit Bitcoin.org, according to routers. Wright's lawsuit accuses Bitcoin.org of copyright infringement for displaying a copy of the infamous Bitcoin white paper, which he claims he wrote in 2008, outlining what Bitcoin is and how it works. He, he's asking the court to force Bitcoin.org to remove the white paper from the website. Bitcoin.org has refused to remove the white paper from the website and posted a statement in January saying Wright's claims are without merit. Wright's goal is to provide evidence that he is the author of 2008 white paper and thus that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. The pseudonym used by the mysterious creator of Bitcoin is lawyer told Routers. Now, the issue here is what evidence there is in regards to this. Now, a lot of people are in the opinion that there is no evidence. Um, now, of course, there there is evidence. Evidence is one of these things that's always subjective. I mean, there is. I mean, Craig Wright has been sa said to being false, being a fraud for a lot of speculative reasons. There's obviously the public he's signing. Now, um, a lot of people said that that was not. The, the, apparently, the initial uh, signing. Um, they've said that that is not definitive evidence because he could have obtained the key through the blockchain. Uh, people always tend to use justifications built of, well, it's possible that this person could be lying because here's, here's what it comes down to. Regardless of what evidence is provided, people will still find reasons not to believe what they don't want to believe. This is why Craig has said, look, even if he w was to do something like to, uh, to, uh, to publicly sign the key or privately sign it or using the, the private key or to use all of the typical 
evidences that would make people know that he is the creator, it still wouldn't convince people. At the end of the day, people would still find a reason not to believe him. People would say that he's stolen the keys, even though he has these keys, even though Gavin Andreessen um, has openly said that, look, he, he met up with him, was convinced that Craig Wright uh, is actually who he says he is. Um, it's interesting because in this article they actually made reference to this, um, but uh, it's interesting that it's presented even to this day that Gavin Andreessen d is very doubtful of the fact that Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto, and he's actually not. He's actually openly said that, yes, he's, he's convinced that, uh, as far as he can be, that Craig Wright is the person that he'd been communicating with during the early days. However, you can't be certain about anything. I mean, it's always possible that it's fraudulent, that, that something uh, could be fraudulent. The Craig Wright, even though he signed the Genesis block, uh, with the uh, the private key, essentially within the presence of Gavin Andreessen, that that could be fraudulent. People have taken that to mean that, oh, well, because it's possible, according to Gavin Andreessen, that he was somehow defrauded, that Craig Wright is a fraud. No. Gavin Andreessen is just saying, yeah, it's possible. Any Anything's possible that could, anything is possible in terms of fraudulence, but he's more inclined to believe that Craig Wright is the creator of Bitcoin. And this is coming from the first of the first person to have worked on Bitcoin that has had more interaction with Satoshi Nakamoto by emails. And it's just interesting that people, even this article, is presenting this narrative that Craig Wright is not Satoshi Nakamoto, Gavin, Andres, Gavin Andreessen doesn't believe he's Satoshi Nakamoto, and so forth. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, um, to wind this article, this is interesting. Who, who people think Satoshi Nakamoto is. Over the past decade, as Bitcoin has grown to reach a total market value of roughly one trillion, speculation has swirled over the true identity of its creator. In 2017, Tesla CEO Elon Musk publicly denied that he was Nakamoto after, after well, how on earth would Elon Musk be the creator of Bitcoin? Does the guy even code? I mean, come on, man. Three years earlier, a California man named Dorian Nakamoto. Yeah, all of this stuff is, everyone wants to play this game where they divert attention away from um, the creator. Craig Wright, because it doesn't fit their narrative. Wright stepped forward in 2016 to say that he is Nakamoto and the inventor of Bitcoin in a blog post at the time. The Australian computer engineer and entrepreneur thanked the online community of Bitcoin developers and miners for promoting the cryptocurrency's massive growth since its launch. This incredible community's passion, he's quoted as saying, this incredible community's passion, intellect, and perseverance has taken my small contribution and nurtured it, enhanced, breathed life into it. You have given the world a great gift. Thank you, Wright wrote. Other skeptics have called Wright's claim a scam, with security researchers claiming that Wright had put forth fraudulent cryptographic proof to back his assertion that he is Nakamoto. Wright had digitally signed a message using cryptographic keys, a string of data-like letters of numbers associated with Nakamoto's Bitcoin, but many researchers believe that Wright simply copied an existing cryptographic signature of Nakamoto's and tried to pass it off as a new and unique. See, people will never believe, people will always come up with re reasons not to believe something. Oh, well, he could have, oh, he could have, like, gone back in time and, and, uh, installing it from the real Nakamoto. <laughs> oh. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to leave this one up to you, but I'm going to invite you guys to actually do some research rather than buying into the narrative. You see, the thing, the thing that's really made me very, disconcerted in regards to uh, society is that society has this thing where, as in individuals, society is very intelligent, I think. As individuals, we all have the capacity to, to figure things out. But as a group, society is retarded. As a group, people buy into things without thinking for themselves. People can be made to do the most atrocious things. People are, can be made to accept ridiculous ideas because other people are accepting them. Trust but verify. Actually do the work Really do the work if you really are concerned about this. And I realize a lot of people don't have the time. But really do the work. Actually go back, have a look at uh, all the evidence. Look at the things in favor of, of this favor and that are not in favor of. You know, whether it deals with the origins of Bitcoin, whether it deals with the pandemic. And then try to arrive at what is really going on. And you will find if you spend enough time and energy and you are honest with yourself, it becomes abundantly clear what is going on. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave it there. Peace out. Keep it real. Don't drive in text. This is your chocolate Nubian soul brother, the esoteric noetic. Be sure to check out 
the links below. Check out my Telegram group. Check out the High Blockchain, where I post a lot of related articles to cryptocurrency, society, human, animal rights. And be sure to check out my podcast. In fact, I would most be thankful if you guys would, uh, would check out my podcast in iTunes, The Crucial Journey, and give it a rating. Give it a five-star rating. You'll find that there is a backlog log of a lot of interviews I've done, even with Satoshi Nakamoto in there. And uh, yeah, I greatly appreciate that. I'm going to be doing some more interviews. I'm going to be starting this thing up again and uh, getting some more interesting guests talking about what's going on in the world of uh, cryptocurrencies, in the world of the uh, hidden agenda, pandemic, scandemic. Until next time, peace out, keep it real, don't drive in text. Surya Namaskara, Namaste, Chris Shul. What is liberty? What the? Who says you can't build muscle on a vegan diet? What's it like being a, a hottie in the vegan community? <laughs> there are no political solutions, only technological ones. The economics of the system don't allow multiple competing systems to survive. Engineering, technology, these arts of humanity, they are magic.